Three, two, one. And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where the exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul Security Weekly. This segment sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the Next Generation Firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them at the, on the web at sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud to engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And finally, by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. It's now time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, give the intern control of your botnet because here's your host. He's a man whose chest hair really isn't on his chest, given that it's hair rivaling in length of jacks of the secondary sexual variety, Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. Happy to be here this week. That's right. We've got Mr. Larry Pesci to my right. Huh. Oh, hey. Look at that. Hi. Hey. On that? the lines via Skype, we've got Mr. Joff Thayer. Joff, welcome to the show. Well, g'day, Paul. It's good to see you again. You're, you're so proud of your microphone, Joff. I'm proud yeah. of you for being so proud of your microphone. Well, everybody's got to have a good microphone. That's all I got, man. <laughs> if that's all you have, dude, you need to... Wow. Wow. You should probably see check yourself before you wreck yourself. You should see a doctor about that. <laughs> <laughs> if your no, microphone, no, microphone stands at attention not, for more than four hours... <laughs> Because yeah. it wouldn't be an episode yet, if we didn't make the four-hour joke. Right, and Jack's not even here. And Jack's not even here. Oh. Jack's on an airplane right now. I know. we so got to figure out a way for people on an airplane to be able to do the show. That would be awesome. If you guys could work on that in the production assistant area, that would be a- a- epic. Epic. Uh, okay, silly question, but don't they have wireless on airplanes? Yeah. Yes, but they restrict access to streaming media services such as Skype. Mm. Believe oh, me, I've well, tried. <laughs> we've got some pretty <laughs> smart people around here. I'm sure we'll figure out a way around that. <laughs> yep. I'm Have you sure. watched a movie on, on uh, Southwest, like through their movie, like paid the $5 because no. you forgot to load a movie on your laptop no. like I did? No. I did. It worked great. Cool. Yeah, no, they, no they've got live TV on Southwest for free. And they've well, they've got movies you can buy for like five bucks. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, I usually I watched one on the way over to to, to I, Vegas. I try I try to uh, load my uh, my uh, Nexus Seven up with a bunch of movies. Yeah. So see, I, I forgot than, to do so that. that I have more so than enough. Actually, my Nexus Seven died. Duh. Doesn't hold it. Doesn't charge. I have to Google. I haven't Googled it. See me after. See me after yeah. about that. I'm is, sure is it's it, fixable. Is it here? It might be. Is it here? If it's here, let me know. Okay. We'll, we'll look at it. Uh, check out the SteelCon competition. Enter to win a security tube training class. You must write documentation. <laughs> sorry for an open source project. I was caught in a wire. Details can be found on the website. The link is in the show nice. notes. SteelCon.info slash competition slash documentation dash competition. Larry's Very teaching cool. SANS security, uh, SANS 617 wireless ethical hacking and defense in Orlando, April 18th, and in Berlin, June 22nd through the 27th. Yeah, April 11th through 18th. But, yeah, uh, April 11th in Berlin, Germany, and there's uh, one right before Germany that is not technically official yet, but it will be there very soon nice. in the Washington, D.C. area. I'd like to bring on our very special guest for this evening, Ming yes. Chow. Ming's an instructor at Tufts University Department of Computer Science. His areas of work are in web and mobile engineering and web security. He has a web appli- He's also a web application developer for 10 years at Harvard. Ming has spoken at numerous organizations, including OWASP, DEF CON, Source Conference, and B-Sides Boston. In his spare time, he likes breaking things, building CTF te- challenges, HTML and JavaScript security, and mobile security. Ming, welcome to the show. Hello, hello, all you happy people. Hello, hello, everyone. Yes. <laughs> nice Great to have here. you. Yeah, nice to have you here on the show, Ming. How'd you get your start in information security? 
Yeah, so it was around 2004. So I finished. Uh, I finished my master's. I was still working at Harvard. Um, I was building web applications, and it was at that time like I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And uh, in the summer of 2004, there was the uh, Usenix. Um, there was a Usenix annual conference here in Boston. And I've never been to a like a professional slash academic conference before. And I, uh, you know, I, I could go. Uh, I know that Harvard was going to pay for me to, you know, go to the talks and even take a couple of courses. And I took a course uh, on software security that was being taught by a man named Gary McGraw. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had Gary on the show. Love Gary. And I didn't even know. I had no idea what security was. I had no idea of Gary's reputation. But uh, I think I was really enthralled with not only the content of the course, but certainly uh, uh, Gary's magnetic personality. I mean, he just drags you in. But also, at that conference, there were a couple of luminaries. Uh, Professor Ed Felton at Princeton, uh, Avi Rubin, uh, 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 no, Avi Rubin from uh, John Hopkins and uh, Avi Jules, and they were doing a panel on security and, and privacy. And I'll never forget uh, Professor Felton's uh, his his message to the crowd is that we have dug ourselves into a really really deep hole. Um, look, we're still fighting the same battles that we've been uh, fighting for years, and we have bad laws. Uh, we have people in government uh, they can't even talk to each other. And then we have all of you who are sitting in the audience, uh, a lot of developers, computer scientists, researchers, who can't even step up to the plate. And, and that message like really, really hit me. Uh, and, of course, the next day, uh, Bruce Schneier talked about you know why everything is so bad with uh, with software. Why everything breaks, and uh, you know the ragtag list of who to blame. And it was that day, it was that conference that what set me up to really delve deeper to explore security. And uh, it was it's been something that I've been really really passionate about since that day, since that conference here in Boston. It really opened my eyes on how bad security is and still and uh, the message that we need to you know we need to do a better job communicating uh, about security problems to not only the general public but also developers as well here here very cool that must have been an awesome conference with given all of those names I mean that just sounds epic. Yeah, it was uh, actually, I think it was a week before. It was the week when Dan Gear got, um, he got uh, let go by At Stake for publishing that paper. And uh, I, I'll, uh, you may recall that he wrote a paper on the cost of monopoly, which basically just bashed Microsoft on. Yeah, I remember that. On being, you know, uh, the only game of a, being a, a monopoly, and just the sake of argument, being just being a monopoly is one of the reasons why uh, it's it it it's, it leads to a security problems. And at that conference, he also had a debate with uh, Scott Charney from Microsoft on uh, you know the whole idea of monopoly and uh, a micro uh, the um, what do they call it you know uh, the cost of monopoly. Uh, what um what languages did you develop in for the web? Initially, when I started out, it was CGI and Perl, and soon we moved away from that to Java. Gotcha. Yeah, those were the good old days when the stack was relatively small compared yeah. to what it is now. Mm. I mean, using Perl and CGI was great because, you know, I had no idea what I was doing in terms of security and made all the mistakes <laughs> in the world. I mean, the great thing is a lot of the stuff that I built for Harvard are still in production. Uh, that's something that I always look back and say I'm 
very proud of. But also at the same time, uh, you know, we had, uh, I worked with uh, someone who was really adamant about security, who was Dr. No. And he was, he was always, one problem was he never, he never understood the whole concept of acceptable risk. And so basically putting anything on the web is a bad idea. But obviously that's not going to apply if, you know, you need to do business with many different places and campuses and, and, uh, and organizations. So I could not tell you how many mistakes we, you know, I made when I built web applications using Perl back in the good old days. What were some of the security challenges being a web app developer for a university? Um, some of the challenges included, well, for me at that time, I was the only one that was doing web application. I mean, I think that's one looking back at it, one of the biggest problems I had working at Harvard was I was the only guy. Mm. Uh, and so I was the only developer. It was not never done. In, it was not done in teams. We did not have revision control. Okay. And in terms of security, the only thing that they did that 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 was that was there was uh, we'll run a few scan. We'll, we'll run a scan. If it fails a scan, then you had to go back and fix everything. But it was never that process. But it was never ever a process of you know I sit down with someone, review the code, sit down, review the code, never you know review the code. And I don't think that happens. Still, at a lot of places these days, either. Yeah, especially so at, you know, got, especially the academic organizations. I think it's it's for whatever reason it's very hard for them to build um, an SDLC that has security built into it. It takes you know a lot of resources to build that. And I, I think a lot of universities don't have those resources. You said at that time you were the only developer. Yeah, well, it's even worse because um, the worst thing about at a big university, is everything is so decentralized. Mm. I mean, at that time, there were at least n number of I like every every school, like the business school, the law school, the graduate school. Everyone had their own IT department back then. But that was wonderful. Everyone had their own IT department. Everyone liked to play their own game, and uh, very few very few times people would even talk to each other. Um, the irony is when I left Harvard at around what 2010, I actually met more people after leaving Harvard than I was there, mm-hmm. and I, when I was working there, uh, it was really hard to to, to find you know, to, to talk to people. Um, yeah, so you weren't you weren't the only web you were the only web developer in your department. I'm sure a lot of the other departments had other web developers, but you never talked to them. No, no, absolutely not, mm-hmm. absolutely not. The only the only line of communication which really helped was I had a I had an intern. His name is Chris Dragano. He's now at Evernote. Uh, after he interned for me, uh, he moved up to the uh, news organization, the news department, the Harvard News Organization. Uh, and so I knew a lot. You know, I had a well someone to talk to over there because of course he was my former intern, and it was great because I knew a lot of things that happened with the university because uh, he was at well he was at Harvard News. Right. Whoa. Yeah, this is one of those oh. where the lights go off on you. Yeah, I was go- I was gonna say <laughs> you lost power, but we were still talking to you. That was yeah, that was and, and I was gonna say, you know, I, Ming, I'm surprised that the lights went off because of inactivity. Because I know you're a very animated individual. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's actually true. And uh, I, I guess they have you have to they, they make you do like handstands or something here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> So, <laughs> Ming, what was your first security presentation? What did you start talking about in the security community? My first presentation I started that I did was in, oh, it was in 2005. It was for NERCOM. It was the Northeast Regional. It was some, it was a, it's a uh, yeah. higher education technology group. I've been there. I think I spoke at one of their events once when I worked for Brown. Yeah, I think we yeah. all got conned into doing the, you know, one, one time <laughs> nah, in our No, I lifetime. wasn't conned. I, I and, it was a, and the great thing was, the one good thing about it was, it was the conference that the, the talk had was at UMass Amherst. And I've never been out to UMass before. I mean, it's, it's far out there. But it I, is. I yeah, I've been to One time yeah. I actually went out to UMass Amherst. And I have to say, it was a big campus. Yeah, uh, like you drive out there and there's like nothing but woods, and then all of a sudden there's yeah. a college campus. <laughs> and it's beautiful. It was, it, a, it was actually a long but yet beautiful drive. Mm-hmm. And I think I talked in, in the, the, the 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 talk was about security compliance. So what could go wrong, and why higher education computing environments are very different, especially with security, because there hardly is there hardly is any. 
because of the open nature of, uh, you know, sort of like research and data and all, uh, research and data, like everything is so open out there. Mm. And uh, Do you think I that's think changed? It, Do you think that's changed today? I don't think so. I really don't think that has changed at all. I mean, could you still work? I mean, you still work with Tufts, at Tufts, right? Or with yeah. Tufts, right? You're an instructor, right? Yes. And uh, the number of, you know, I mean, if you can just take a look, if you ever go to Shodan, you can see the number of, you know, servers that are completely wide, that are wide open. Yeah. You know, from colleges and universities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I even see a lot of researchers even spin up a lot of, spin up even a lot of servers. I mean, I know that... Uh, yeah, you know, that's interesting you say that, Ming, because now we're in this kind of interesting state where we've got virtualization, we've got cloud, we've got software as a service applications, mm-hmm. and we've got mobile technology. And the costs to spinning up all of that new technology just keep plummeting. I bought, yeah. a, I bought a tablet for a dollar and added it to my data plan on AT&T for 10 bucks a month. Damn. Cellular data. Yeah, I, I'm not terribly surprised. I mean, how in the world did you get a tablet for a buck? That's another yeah, question. I scored. I was in the store like the day the deal was ending, and he had two of them. I, 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 in hindsight, I should have just gotten two of them. They're an LG G Pad. I don't know. It works well enough for my kids to to use it and keep them occupied when they're you know on long trips and in various places. Yep. But the other thing, Ming, I don't know while I'm on the subject, I'm, I'm, I'm just totally derailing the conversation. Sure. So I got an AT&T, or I guess my friend Bob also got this same deal. And Bob <laughs> got this AT&T hotspot, which is called the AT&T uh, Unite, which really is, in Bob's research after Bob took it apart, a Netgear 781S uh, <laughs> router. <laughs> And there's a SIM card in there, right? Obviously, that has data on it, obviously, that adds to your plan, right? That's oh, right. Sure. So Bob took the SIM card out of his Netgear 781S and put it in Bob's phone phone, <laughs> which is just the Nexus 5. <laughs> but to Bob's dismay, Bob couldn't get internet access off this data card. Oh. It shows as a data card on the phone, from what Bob tells me, you get no internet access from it. You put it back in the Netgear 781S, and internet is fine. What? What's the deal with that? Hey, Paul. Yeah. I have no idea, but isn't this one of the problems that Apple's trying to solve with like a universal SIM card that you can put it in anything and it will work? Right. I think Bob needs to uh, spoof the MAC address. Or the uh, the IMEI. Or the IMEI. Yeah. Or both. Or yeah. both. That's kind of what Bob was thinking. There's yeah. got to be some locking, <laughs> I think. There has to be some locking. There has to be, but there's something on the SIM that is locking it to that device. Like that SIM has something on it that says, I only work with this MAC address or IMEI mm. number. Not sure what the MAC address. Uh, probably, I mean, it definitely would sound like an IMEI. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no idea what the MAC address. I mean, that's... Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's too easily. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. What were we talking about before that? <laughs> we were talking uh, about higher education fails. I don't know. <laughs> higher education. <laughs> Man, fails. this conversation could oh, go on all night. I, I wanted. Yeah, we, we're just all over the place. It's great. Um, so, when you teach your students computer science, how do you teach them security? A lot of people will kind of like, I think, give a higher education a bad name for saying, "Well, you teach people how to use technology, but you don't teach people how to write secure code." So, yeah. what do you do, Ming, to to make sure that your students understand security? Yeah, so I'll tell you what I did recently, and actually what I what we had today. So on the first day of class, in my security class, I tell everyone one message. Look, the purpose of this class for you is not to be a ninja. This is not, that's not the outcome of this class. Is that, you know, this is, you're not here to be a ninja. You're not here to just break stuff. And you're also not here to just learn just crypto. You're going to learn a little bit about everything that runs a full gamut with with security so i give them the first thing i do is i uh i give them uh, uh i give an overview of network pack networks and network packets and what they have to do in the very first assignment is to analyze uh sets of pcap from defcon mm. uh, that's number one and see analyze them for anything any like username and passwords uh found in the defcon network 
and uh, also any other like hidden files, like PDF stuff. And uh, so that's that's number one. What we have been doing recently, as the last few weeks, is that I ran a captured flights game, and uh, it's web. It's, they actually have to hit a real web server hosted. Actually, it's in Miami. So I say, okay, here is the IP address. Here's the IP address. Uh, they type it in on their uh, They type it in, of course. What you'll see is the front end is a WordPress blog, uh, which is like the front gateway to the entire game. And this is a riddled web application, which is a message board. And the point of it is to find uh, SQL injection, uh, SQL injection, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cookie tampering, more SQL injection, uh, security by obscurity, um, just asking for it. And I think this past, the, the past game I just ran had 10 flags. Well, a good number of them were SQL injection based. So the first part of the game that they played was just finding flag cap. <laughs> Now what they're doing is I've given them the entire source code. I've given the source code of the entire game of the, you know, it's a PHP. Is everything is all PHP. Uh, and now what they have to do is, okay, analyze the source code not only by hand to find all the vulnerabilities, but also to use uh, static analysis. Uh, actually, we use uh, <laughs> Veracode static analysis uh uh, engine, uh, because uh, thanks to well, thanks to Chris Weissopel, and uh, they have to do a report, a risk analysis table, a technical risk analysis table of all the vulnerabilities, all the risks uh, with the with the software, uh, how to mitigate them, and uh, and how to mitigate them as well. So it's they play offense, then they actually do code analysis. Uh, and uh, I also bring in a lot of guest speakers to uh, shed light on what se how security really is like in, in the real world. And today I had uh, Steve Christie Coley come in to talk about CWE and CVE. And he yes. said hello, by the way. He sent you all his warmest regards. Excellent. Uh, so, nice. But the big idea, the big point, the big outcome of this course, the security course I teach in the computer science department here at Tufts is the ultimate, the, 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 the big goal is to understand the full gamut of all the security issues, not just crypto, not just network security, not just web security, not just mobile security, but everything. It's to build their intellectual curiosity to, you know, to say, you know, security runs a full gamut. After you take this course, hopefully you'll choose, you know, you can learn more about in, in a certain area. But more importantly, the ultimate goal is the students, uh, I want them to be good citizens. I want them to be good citizens. And yeah, that no, is right now, lesson, yeah. look, we're still fighting the same battles that we have for, what, 10 years now? I mean, what, when I first learned security, I mean, the big issues were SQL injection, cross-site scripting, you know, remote code execution. What are the big issues now? SQL injection cross-site scripting, remote code execution. I mean, there's the same stuff that we are facing that we faced 10 years ago. Look, we're still fighting the same battles 10 years ago. We did something wrong. Well, and so and what, and what's interesting, Ming, is the, some, of the recent, uh, some of the recent big bugs are in code that has been around for 10 years, right? The yeah. uh, bash bug, the uh, recent stuff in FTP and WGET. I mean, that code's been around for a while. Uh, what, what's what's the biggest? Citizens. What are the biggest lessons you learned from your students? The biggest lesson that I've learned from the students is they're very creative, and they're also very smart as well too. I mean, they were. Oh, here comes the lights again. Mm. Um, they actually they enjoy the topic, and more importantly, that is if this that's their first exposure ever to security. That's 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 really shocking to me, and I still talk to a lot of students, a lot of former students, and I say, "Where did you uh, where did you hear about uh, like cross-site scripting, and SQL injection, and all these security bugs?" And they say, "Your class, I mean, you integrate security." I mean, that's the only time it's like eye-opening for them yeah. because they've never been exposed to security in any other course or in, in, in any curriculum. That's that's the eye-opening thing. Is that. You know, you can they can read all about security in the news, but in terms of understanding, you know, the problem and how big it is and what you can do, this is their first time. This is their first exposure. Hey, uh, so Ming, go ahead, Joff. 
Ming, this is Joff. Uh, I, I got a quick question for you, and, and, and this revolves around that particular point. And, and like yourself, like Paul, I have a university background. So why do you think that is? One of the things that's always concerned me in, in the university space when I, when I was there and, and, and both as a college student and as a professional is that it didn't seem to me that the college uh, faculty – uh, with with the uh, freshmen and, and sophomore students, we're teaching any security in their software development. No. And, you know, that that's fundamentally um, what you're expressing here. And, and why not? And, and they should be. Um, can you it, respond to that? Yeah. And uh, I don't know if anyone – and this was – I think this, this data actually really, really support this point is the importance of – I mean the emphasis – of security in a computer science curriculum, in a computer science curriculum, is uh, is very low. It's is very low. There was a talk at I didn't go to Hope. It was this past summer at Hope. Uh, someone gave a presentation on you know somewhere along the lines of where does security rank in a computer science curriculum in general, and uh, they showed a chart. Sam Boney actually uh, 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 sent this, uh, shared this on Twitter, and it was really, really compelling. It was the first numbers one and number two, you know, areas of importance in computer science. In in, in, in terms of emphasis, were data structures and algorithms. Data structures and algorithms were the number one and number two most emphasized topics in computer science. Where did security fall? Was way down in the totem pole. I mean, I think it came be- right before or after security. It was way down in the list. So in terms of the emphasis in, in security, it's very, very low. And I can also tell you that a few years ago when we went through the ABET accreditation uh, here, which is, like, uh, which is the organization that accredits com- engineering programs, a lot more schools go through this. And I, I know that we got uh, – we were uh, we were uh, uh, informed that there is no required class in our curriculum that actually talks about security. Really? Yeah. No. Now, now, do you think that is because, fr- from the undergraduate perspective, do you think that's because security is an advanced topic, and that our faculty don't feel like their students at that early point in their career are ready to learn about that? Or do you think there's just, you know, a complete um, uh, blindness to the topic and then they're just refusing to get into it? I think there's a complete blindness. I think there is a, there is a complete blindness to, to this topic. I guess the emphasis is, especially look at, I mean, you, you see it in, in development. I mean, what's the, what's the point of most computer, like, let's say the good computer science courses, um, you know, you focus on the theory. You focus on the communications, like the communication, like read, like writing and coding and writing good comments and all that. Um, you you may talk about you may talk about um, test and test cases, but the whole question of what could possibly go wrong that's never ever been brought up. I mean, I studied computer science for what four four six years. And I don't remember in any of my classes, like any of my, especially the implementation and system programming system courses, you know, have that question ever, ever been brought up in anything for me. Like what could possibly go wrong? It's never been asked of me. Ming, that, that's a great point. I think in all kinds of engineering, what I'm finding is in talking with people that so many things are designed to just work and be yeah. usable. Uh, and not fail, that whatever you're designing, whether it be software, hardware, a product, doesn't matter. A hammer, as I've said on the show before, right? People are designing those things to be usable and reliable and not fail. Sure. And it never – it's not in our design and development mindset to think about, well, how can someone abuse this? What can people do – with it that is outside of the normal mode of operations and are there things that I can do to prevent that? And you just said that that's true in software development and I I kind of, I haven't taken that and put it in the context of software development, but I I think that's a valid point that we may have flirted with that idea in the past, but I think 
th that's an extremely valid point that so I think some of the cultural changes that need to happen with respect to software development, let's say, is that you need to start thinking about getting developers to understand how their code may be abused by people. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it, when you're a new programmer, I mean, there's so many other things that you're trying to learn and get a handle on that that concept is so far and removed from how you learn how to build software, but it needs to be part of that process, I think, if we're going to end up with secure products in the future. Yeah, I mean, you take a look at mobile, like mobile development. Yeah. Uh, what's the name one. of the game now? It's to push, push first, first to go to the market. Push, push whatever, push whatever work you got to the market. And I, I like to say this to people. It's like, uh, you know, in what in psychology, there's a Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs. I mean, for human, for humans, at the very baseline, the needs are what food and water, right? But the high man's the, the hierarchy of need when you're an engineer, when you're a developer, is exactly what you said, Paul. Just make the damn thing work. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of security, it's always been an afterthought. Like security has always been an afterthought. Um, I think it also is compounded, made worse, especially if there's a lot. And of course, in software development, there's a lot of people that there's a lot of arrogance. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, there's a lot of hot shots out there. I know that happens in like in in, in San Francisco or, or in startups saying, "Oh, you know what? We have secure. You know what? I uh, we're, we're really good programmers. You know, none of this stuff is ever going to happen to us." Uh, that certainly doesn't help the case as well. Um, over the years, I've gone to uh, I've gone to uh, have a really, really uh, I wouldn't go sick mind, but now I can be really sinister <laughs> in coming up with like inputs and stuff uh, that can that can break a web application. Or that can break a, that can break a application of some sort. It took years to develop, but we need to start somewhere in having people to start think about. You know what could possibly go wrong, and I know that's one thing that you know. One thing I took away with with uh, Gary McGraw's stuff is that he really, really that you know say whatever you want about you know some things that he does, but and I know that's a message that uh, I certainly take away from him, and that I I, I share with people is you got to start to think like a bad guy. You got to yeah. start yeah. to think about this in your development in your design process, not an afterthought. Are you um, into some mobile development, or are you just looking at it from a security perspective? I've done both. Okay. I've, uh, in fact, I um, I have one app that is, you know, the MBTA, the trains. Yeah. So I have an app on uh, that's uh, very both the same one for uh, one for Android and one for iOS that determines your location and shows the closest train station near you with the real-time train schedule. So that's actually up. So I, I built that. But I also built an app for uh, Android that's called the Dancing Pig uh, this past summer. And what the Dancing Pig is, uh, it's an Android app because it needs to be an Android app. And what it does is if you install it on your device, on your phone, what it will do is it will take the name of all your apps and send it to somewhere, some remote location. Uh, so why did I build this app? Uh, there was this old saying by Gary McGraw and Ged Felton saying, what, if, if people had a choice between dancing pigs and security, they'll always pick dancing pigs. And so... Wow. <laughs> Yeah, right. that's that's an old saying. I mean, you look. I I didn't even believe it. Like a few days ago, I found it on Wikipedia. But this is old saying. Like if people, are, you know, they, they're they they're one of the old sayings is if people had a choice between dancing pigs and security, people would take dancing pigs. And so I I think I got really bored this summer or something. Uh, and so I, I I I said, you know what? That's it. I'm gonna build an app for Android that is called the Dancing Pig app, and it's gonna steal data. You know, just people just just download and install it because Android's environment. Hey, I mean, Android, you can do whatever you want and mm -hmm. get away with it, generally speaking. And so I built this app, and I had like a already like over a dozen, way over a dozen people already downloaded this app, and I've captured uh, the names of all the apps that's been installed on their device. I commented out the code that actually uh, steal SMS messages as well. Nice. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so what are your thoughts on 
the new uh, the Palo Alto research on this new iOS uh, flaw that uh, there's a third party app store in China that was actually distributing uh, an app that was uh, in fact malware. Have you read up on that? I I heard of it. I didn't read it entirely. I didn't need read it entirely. But from what I from what I read, isn't this app store controlled like somewhere in China because you know, so that the government can monitor people's actions, something like that. It is. From my understanding, it's an authorized app store in China. So Apple authorized this app store to distribute apps for the iOS platform, but it's just... It is China. iOS. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, strictly because they have different controls for yes. the stuff in China. Yep. <coughs> <coughs> Absolutely. Excuse me. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, then again, it is a you know, they the government do control a lot of things in China. I mean, I, I've never been there. I've never been there. Um, you know, uh, but I know that Apple is trying to shut it down. Is, is Apple shutting it down? They did. They well, they removed the app from that particular app store. Oh, so this is going to be fun. This is like police state versus police state. <laughs> this is exactly the situation. <laughs> wow, I'm really glad I wasn't having anything to drink when you said that. <laughs> That's really funny. So I wow. mean, when I when I talk about mobile security, I, I always compare. Well, I mean, there's a motto I always like to use is you have Apple, which is a police state, and in Android, you can do whatever you want. I mean, and unfortunately, because you can do whatever you want, I mean, that's why the malware campaign on Android is just, you know, astronomically a lot higher than iOS, not a surprise. And so the motto I always tell people is, hey, you know what? Say whatever you want about Apple, but at least a police state actually works to a degree. <laughs> Wow. So now we have a situation where the police state is fighting the police state. Don't know what's going to happen there. Mm-hmm. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. So, so here, I, 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 I'd like to pose a question, and that is this: um, I think something we struggle with in the industry is is the idea that uh, we should put the uh, onus on the end user in some ways to to protect themselves, right? And we've yeah. we've miserably failed with that. I um, mean, you can argue with that assertion, you know, back and forth as much as you want. But if you look at the sort of police state mentality of, of iOS versus the uh, wild, wild west mentality of Android, um, you know, you can certainly ascribe some some degree of success to the to the police state mentality. So, so given that assertion, can you contrast that with the the idea that that we haven't even managed to educate our developers to get on board? And yet alone here in the industry, in the IT industry in general, we're trying to think that our users are actually going to get on board and, and be able to defend themselves. Well, so I think there's one thing I'm not going to argue with, and uh, I think uh, I, I think there's a number of people I'm not, you know, a number of people said that we failed because you know if you if you resort if you resort to the to the users. Um, if you resort to the users to protect themselves, I mean, then you fail. We know that. But I guess your question is with, you know, educating users, if you can't do that. I can tell you one thing. If, if you educate the developers, if you educate developers and uh, they, they still, you know, they still make the same mistakes, uh, then at least you can say, hey, at least we got the word out there. But I can tell you this much right now. Developers in general, a lot of developers are just completely clueless. They have no idea that this stuff is happening. So do you think that's my problem is that right now, I think right now, there's a lot of developers that don't don't even, it's not even aware of security. I mean, the word's not even out there to so many of the developers out there. I mean, especially you take a look at the, a lot of kids in, in college. I mean, especially a lot of the ones that uh, the ones that really entrepreneurial mind about it. They just want to make a lot of money and be famous and all that fun stuff. They have no idea. They don't even have any idea that this there is something called a security problem. They're, they're not even aware. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this comes full circle back to the uh, the curriculums at, at, at undergraduate colleges and, and, and bringing essentially an approach of teaching the security development life cycle along with their software development teaching efforts so that it starts them out, um, starts our students out at a completely different place um, because you, I think you're right. Fundamentally, there's, there's just a complete lack of an awareness and a lot of developers come to it 
um, later in their careers, and of course it's it's way too late because they've birthed a lot of code by then. Right. Um, and I'm not, and and I would not go as far as saying that all developers are in that category. There are certainly some very bright, very interested students who go after security from an early age. They tend to end up in our industry rather than the software development industry, and I guess that's a bit of a um, maybe a sad reflection to some degree because if they could bring that kind of approach back into the software development industry, they could really help out uh, the industry as a whole. But um, yeah. okay, that, that's, yeah, that's that's what I was looking for. And you know, I, I guess I I can tell you this much, and this is the shocking thing: is most uh, there's a lot of students walking. I don't care what school you went to. I, I just don't care what school you went to. But you know, school like when you're coming out of the computer science program. And you want to do engineering and software development? They have zero exposure to security. I mean, zero, absolute none. They didn't even know that this 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 problem even existed, uh, especially in the in the engineering level. Uh, and and that doesn't help. And that's why I always joke with uh, with my security student. Fantastic class I have this year, by the way. I always joke. You know what? It's actually your fault. I mean, we, I think we failed you in terms of, you know, you're walking out of here with like zero, no, zero exposure to security. I mean, it was shocking to me that a few days ago I mentioned the whole issue of uh, static analysis versus dynamic analysis, and they've never heard of both ever, ever, ever before. So, I mean, oh, it's yes. Right. I mean, they've never heard of static analysis or dynamic analysis. I mean, I have to require them to do this in the labs, right? Not only because you know, I had to, I had to force them to use it, so they actually have some exposure to to what they are. Yeah, yeah. It strikes me that our efforts overall are much better spent at the developer level because if we can start there, uh, we can at least make enough of an impact to help the the SDLC side of things uh, to to uh, m mitigate some of the risks for new software going forward, but. Uh, at the user end of it, um, I'm sort of uh, with you. I think it's a bit of a lost cause, right? Because most of our users just want to see this stuff as a toaster. They just want it to work, make toast, uh, and they can walk away and, and, and eat their toast, you know. So, um, yeah. All right, I, back to you guys. I have a dear colleague that said, you know, and he joked. I know he was joking. And he said that security is not profitable, Uh Maybe that's also another reason why we don't emphasize on it because it's not profitable. But I hate to break it to you. When something does happen, you know, then you get the cost ramp up big time, like with legal legal fees and uh, settlements and uh, take a look at TJ Maxx and uh, take a look at TJ Maxx and uh, all the brick and mortar places that just had POS problems uh, as of recent and we know who they are and we know that the cost is going to be really, really big. Um, you know, and I've always said to my, uh, when I taught uh, software engineering slash senior capstone, I said, look, security is not a bolt on. I mean, it's throwing money at the problem is not going to work. I mean, you can buy all the fancy, fancy things and tools out there, but first of all, do they work? I don't know. But number two, there's a reason why, you know, we failed because security has been looked at as an afterthought and as a bolt on, like a band aid. But isn't, isn't that to some degree responsible for the creation of the industry that, that a lot of us in, um, on this podcast and others reside in, right? We do yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good point. And uh, if it wasn't for that, then we would be looking for other careers as, as, as well, too. Yeah, that's very true. So, um, so to but, some degree, I, I feel like we are somewhat complicit, but it's, and I wouldn't say it's all our fault, but we're certainly benefiting from it. Sure. Sure, um, but at the you know, at the same time, there's also a lot of products out there in our business that don't work as well, that don't work. You know, snake oil. Yeah. So it's a we got we got a good thing and a bad thing going on here. You know, you got you know yes, you got products that actually help the security. Yes, that's helping us out. That's helping the industry. But at the same time, some of them just don't work. It's like complete snake oil. So you got it's a double-edged sort of a problem here. Mm -hmm. I'll let Paul ask questions now. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Joff. <clears throat> no, that that was great. Um, so Ming, what are you working on now? Like, do you have any projects going on? Do you create like projects for your students? Like, you got anything like in the works that you want to share on the show? 
Uh, well, uh, I, uh, you know, I just gave a presentation on, you know, the looking ahead, how big the MongoDB problems are going to be. Um, of course, that's something that uh, mm. I've been working with with Russell Butterini. Yep. Well, I know that you that he was on the show with a big Manchester City flag behind him. <laughs> uh, it was the last episode or two episodes ago. So uh, I gave a presentation on look. Now we got this Internet of Things thing. Yay! Uh, Internet of Things, and uh, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of uh, plans to uh, grow MongoDB to uh, be a very very vital part of Internet of Things because look. We're gonna need. We're gonna now. We got everything connected to the network. We can collect a lot of data as well too. And what can we use to store uh, lots of data? Well, we can use things like MongoDB, which, by the way, security is a complete afterthought. You can just. I mean, people just take out a box and install it, and we can just walk right into it. So I gave that. So that's still in the works. Mink, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have to come back and talk about the security implications of embedded systems combined with mobile applications, combined with cloud applications, combined with big data and the security challenges that that brings us. Because that's kind of where that's what we're talking about right now. Yeah. That's, it's very yeah. interesting. And it's that's actually, uh, if one of my coworkers at Tenable was uh, describing that to me and helped me kind of, you know, draw those lines between all of those different things and they all work together. I'm like, yeah. So what you're saying is my Nest thermostat at home is a combination of an embedded system that hangs on my wall. Mm -hmm. It's got Wi-Fi, and it's an embedded device that I can access. It talks to a system in the cloud mm -hmm. that's housing everyone's Nest data, and I can get to it from a mobile app on my phone. I'm like, ugh, mind melts. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is all connected <laughs> together. In fact, this semester I'm teaching a course on mobile medical devices and apps. So students have to build a mobile a medical device nice. that has an iPad app, an iPad, uh, uh, an iPad interface, and of course, um, uh, the medical device piece uses an Arduino. And the course has both electrical engineers and electrical mm -hmm. computer engineers and computer scientists uh, students. And they, uh, I can tell you right now that um, they, everyone have to work together. All the pieces have to work together. Now we've gone to a point where if you're a electrical or a computer engineer. Just knowing how to do the hardware and the electrical part without knowing software, that's nearly, that's almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're just a computer science or software person, it's also, you, you, may be get all, you may be able to get away with not knowing anything about uh, electrical and hardware stuff, but that's also very hard to do. Now, everything is just coming together. It's just like, Everything is just becoming like one. It's, everything is mashed in together. Right. Um, so Ming, very important before we run out of time here, we need to ask you five questions. Okay. Are you ready? Well, ready or not? Absolutely. Here they come. Three words to describe yourself. Jerk. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, I thought that was going to be it. <laughs> uh, uh, no BS. That's three words. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, if I was a serial killer, oh, that should be a pretty easy one for me. It would be uh, a really, really sharp knife. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Ooh. You know, one... I, if I had to... I, I would say... Uh, the title will have to be, because I've been enamored with a certain book, will be called uh, I Am Ming, or This Is Ming, as a play on, there's a book out there called I Am Latin, who is a uh, very, very famous, but yet arrogant soccer, uh, European soccer player. And I, uh, you know, I think, uh, because I used, I'm still, you know, a fond fan of wrestling. Uh, my favorite wrestler is Sting. And he would be introduced as this is Sting. Nice. That would be the title. Cool. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, I 
the answer, how I will answer that question is whatever Paul and Florian decide. Well, it, it would depend on where we were playing at the time. The rules are different in Europe as they are here. So. <laughs> they are, they're different, actually. Unless in Vegas. That's right. Vegas, yes. different rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. American rules, uh, North American rules, European rules, <clears throat> South West, American West rules. rules. That's right. Or Vegas, Vegas rules. rules. Vegas I, I defer the decision to whatever Paul decide or uh, Vegas what rules. Jason Street decide. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. To be my parents? To be your parents. Mommy and daddy. Okay. Um, I would say for... This could be any celebrity. Living or dead. Okay, living or dead. Um, probably for my... On the paternal side... I could see I could see Tiger Woods. Ooh, wow, right. I could see Tiger Woods because, of course, <laughs> he has that military background, um, and of course, we know you know the stuff that he he, he went through. I think that would help. <laughs> so, on the maternal side, the <laughs> remains unknown. <laughs> uh, some some Good blonde question. with big boobs. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, if I think of someone who could be completely who could be really interesting, would be a uh, Obviously, Kathy Bates come to mind. Mm. Mm. Nice. Wow. I mean, if you remember watching Waterboy, yikes. Yeah. Ming, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. It was great having you. Oh. Um, we hope to come back. We, we'll, see you at a, we'll see you around. Yeah, we'll, we'll see we're see not you that far like from each other. Out again. Yeah. But just look at that. I will, uh, certainly it's been a pleasure. Uh, finally, you know, whoa, well, with the lights. Here we go. Uh, well, would love to be back on. You know, I've had a blast. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys for everything that you have done for, for, for security as well. Thank you so much, Ming. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the stories for this week. Woo!